was thought that this kind of generative transformational linguistics would actually help translation. Happily, Chomsky said early on in aspects that it would not help translation. Anyway, so that, that was cut short as a project. Uh, but the term universal has got to say, well, universal is deep-seated, underlying, you know, explain, able to explain many other things. It's got to be on that level. But if you look at the research done here on exploitation, it's just surface level comparison. There's nothing deep or transformational. There's no attempt to explain a whole lot of phenomena on, on the surface of manifestation. There's no psychology behind it. It's just counting items and comparing them. So it's, it's not universal in a Chomskyan sense. And then, if it's universal, okay. I've got a translation? Yes, it's true. Got a translation? Yes, it's true. Got a translate? Oh, it's not true for this one. Oh dear. So it's not universal. What does universal mean? Has to occur in all translations that we find? Occurs in most translations? 51%? It's a democratically elected universal? I don't <laughs> think that's going to work that way either. Okay. Uh, so there's been very little thought about what universal is. In a, in a philosophical sense, that is deep-seated, able to explain phenomena, um, and very little basic statistics done to say what kind of statistics would count uh, uh, as giving us a, a universal phenomenon. And then, even if we did discover that this thing does happen in the majority of translation acts, a healthy majority. Okay. So what? I mean, what's entitled to do that? When you, you do a bit of research and you say, here's my result, did you know that? Boom. And so you say, oh, that's interesting, so what? Well, you're entitled to say, so what, for as long as you can't say why this thing might have occurred. And very little research has been able to address that problem of why. If it does occur, why should it occur? Because we haven't been doing psychology, we haven't been doing process studies. Most of this is surface level counting of things in texts. Let me go through these problems one by one. The what. Here's some examples. Um, I'm taking this from a study with Portuguese English. Don't worry, Portuguese is... Does anybody speak Portuguese here? Thank you. You can read this for me in a minute. <laughs> okay. uh, the focus has been on grammar words, as I said. Here's the source. Francis liked her doctor. Francisco estava de América. More close enough? Yeah, well, right. <laughs> um, uh, Francis liked that female doctor. Okay? In Portuguese, it's a female doctor. Back translation, female doctor. Is that explicitation? We don't know. Okay? You'd have to be sure that the doctor was indeed female, but the source sec text doesn't say it. It's giving more information, but we can't be sure if it was implicit. Okay? The second one, though, is more interesting. Um, something like that do you like her too but the translation is so you like her too ok uh, the translator has added so now there I think if you go back to the original text and you can see that the two sentences are connected you can say yes there is a connection and putting in the so is justified. And so there, I would call that explicitation. In the first case, I would be unhappy. I would say it's a case of translator guessing, perhaps. And the second one, fine, I would call that explicitation. And I think it's interesting when people do that. That's why I think most of the research has been restricted to grammar words and not lexical items.
Second problem, implicitation. Um, now, implicitation wasn't really looked at until some Hungarian scholars, notably Kinga Claudi and Christina Caroli, looked at explicitation. Now, these were really comparative linguists. Okay? They, they were comparing languages like Vina Dabuli. And they wanted to have a way to isolate voluntary explicitation, to separate it from obligatory ex explicitation. Obligatory is what your language system obliges you to do. And the voluntary stuff is what belongs to the psychology of the translator. So how can we do that? And they had a very, very elegant solution, and it's here. Now, if you've got two languages arranged in such a way that big brother in Chinese and brother in English are such that every move here, if it's literal, will be implicitation, and every move there, if it's literal, will be explicitation, then that's a normal occurrence. If we're just comparing language systems, every act of explicitation one way should be implicitation the other way. And they balance each other out. So their solution to isolating voluntary explicitation was to look for play, uh, situations of non-symmetrical implicitation explicitation. It's uh, don't worry about it. But from that, you started to get people looking for instances of implicitation, and some people discovered texts with more implicitation than explicitation, which made things very problematic. Now for the universal, universality. Consider the following cases. Would you say that subtitles of a film are more explicit or implicit than the source, which is the spoken language? Take a guess. Because you haven't got enough space. Right? Uh, you can read very fast, you can put a lot of information there. Although there are instances of explicitation for a cultural phenomena where you really have to explain things, it can happen, it does happen, there's so much more implicitation just because of the restriction of how much space you've got. So it's hard to see how the universal can apply to subtitling, for example. Uh, this came from a student, a doctoral student who's been looking at ATA exams. Looked at lots and lots of exam, exam people becoming members of the American Translators Association. And she came and said, you know, I've looked at about 200 translation texts. I haven't found any explicitation. Something's wrong. No, not wrong. It's just an exam situation. People are so scared of deviating from the source text <laughs> that they're not going to risk being, you know, putting in ex explicitation or any help there. And the reader of the translation is an expert in the source language, so why the hell should you be helping them anyway? So what are you going to do? You're going to say it works, it's universal for all translations except for exams. Think you're going to do exams, right? Are you going to use explicitation? Well, probably not. Um, software localization, that is highly standardized uh, glossaries, terminology, all fixed up before you enter the scene. It's all in your translation memory. You just have to verify it. You're not going to find much explicitation or implicitation there. If in any case of controlled writing where the source text uh, is in a, a simplified syntax, one of the ways of writing good source text for automatic translation or multiple localization projects is to remove all redundancy. Remove deitics. Technical language these days doesn't use precisely the deitics that were being tested here. For reasons I think I mentioned, people are not reading a linear text, they're reading chunks of information. Pharmaceutical translation. If you're writing the instructions for the use of a medication, are you going to, you, me, a translator, you're going to put in some helpful hints 
or risk guessing what was implicit? No way, you're going to get big lawsuits filed at you sooner or later if you start doing that. You can ask them to rewrite the source text to make it more explicit if necessary, but explicitation is probably not going to occur in that particular conference story. interpreting. Since I think that interpreting is part of translation, I, I'm, I'm interested, you know, would explicitation count in consecutive interpreting? Very difficult, because you reduce the text by 30% anyway. Okay. Or conference interpreting. Perhaps, yes, for a few um, cultural references, the lexical kind, yes. But you wouldn't expect it to happen uh, for any of the grammar words that we'd be looking at. Indeed, anywhere where there are constraints of time and or space, I would not expect to find explicitation. And it seems to me to be a luxurious universal reserved for those few academic translators who have no money to worry about. That's lots of time. However, it has been found, it has been proved, there is something there, I think. If it's there, why is it there? Here are some of the potential causes of it. Because you've got time, you think you should do something with that time, so you're wasted adding things to the text. Yeah? Don't know. Perhaps, but it doesn't, sort of, it doesn't convince me that much. How are you paid for your translations? I'm paid by the number of words in the translation I produce. So if I produce more words, I get more money, so I'm going to be very explicit. I don't think so. I do. It's an argument. Vinay and Dabalne said translators do it out of um, uh, lack of prudence, that is, not careful enough, or ignorance. They don't know that they don't have to do it. I found that rather rude of them. <laughs> but, but interesting, uh, because one of the early, um, in, the, in the 1960s, Georges Mounin, uh, identified, he said, one of the main faults in translation is over-translation. That many translators are really trying to do too much, they're trying to make things too clear, they're trying to help the reader uh, beyond what is discursively justifiable, and this ignorance does seem to fit into that. You know, if translators could really compare the languages, as we know doubly do, they would see they don't have to do it. That there is implicit language redundancy on both sides of the equation. A more serious argument is this, that uh, readers of the target text, readers of the translation, are not as familiar with the source culture by definition, because they don't have linguistic access to it, therefore they need more help. Okay, this is the one that was used for justifying the Eton translation. When Hönig and Kusma presented that, they, they said the German reader has to be told about Eton. As I think I might have mentioned, Peter Newmark then replied, how dare you insult German readers? Everybody knows of the prestige of Eton. Which is probably true among educated German readers, and, and that this was a grossly uh, debasing assumption about the intelligence of the readers. However, it remains a possible cause. Here's some others, though. One argument is that the act of translating involves two things, reading and writing. So, psychologically, you have to decode what's there so that you understand it, and then reproduce it. And as a reader, you are therefore aware of what is difficult or could be difficult. And therefore, explain the problems that you encountered. Like, I had to figure out what St. Mary's was here. I've done a bit of research. I figured it must be a girls' school of some prestige. I'm going to save you the reader the problem of doing the research I've done, and I'm going to put it in there. Okay? So this is helping the reader, but why should you help the reader? Because you have just needed help yourself. 
you've worked and you want to relay the fruits of your work, your interpretative processing of this text, uh, to the other people. Translators explicitate because they are subservient and like to help. I like this one. I don't think it's true, but a lot of people over the ages have thought it might be true. Um, it, it, I remember years ago, did I tell you about this? Um, we were discussing why are translators usually badly paid? Not you guys, you're going to be very well paid. You don't have to worry about this. But often they're badly paid. And, and, uh, one, an American, um, said, well, yeah, you know, it's, it's one of the nurturing professions. There are some professions in society where people um, do it for the love of doing it, for helping others. Nurses are badly paid in most societies. Teachers, primary teachers, <coughs> primary school teachers, elementary school teachers are usually badly paid. But they do it because they love doing it to help others. That's the reward. The reward is human and not monetary, so who's going to pay them? And the argument was that translators might fall into that category. We are one of the nurturing professions, helping people understand each other, and we're supposed to love doing it so much that people are not going to pay us. And that's why we explicitate. Okay, I'll leave it there as a possible <laughs> hypothesis. Easy to test, you know, you can get some volunteer translators who do translate regularly, and there's professionals who <coughs> translate for a lot of money and have to go very fast and, and see what happens. I don't know. I don't know if that would be true. If there would be more explicitation among the volunteers and the professionals, perhaps. And, and my personal um, contribution to the debate, uh, I think looking at the evidence that's there, of all the universals actually, and of Turi's laws, I think that translators tend to be risk adverse. They don't get rewards for taking risks, so they tend not to take risks. If in doubt, explicitate to make the relation very clear, because ambiguities tend to be risky, but they won't use explicitation when there is significant doubt because there are cases of uh, cultural reference which are re references which are ambiguous and translators there, if they're smart, tend to use omission. You know, if you're not sure which way it's going, generalize or leave it out. But um, for me, the use of explicitation does fit into a, a model in which translators tend to be risk adverse. Then again, In all this research, and I think in the papers you're going to look at now, there's been a lack of comparative perspective. <coughs> Nobody has really asked if it happens in other uses of language. One experiment that's been done, I don't think it's been published, so I can't really give it to you as the gospel truth, but this was a Lebanese girl in Sydney in Australia. Had people getting a story in Arabic, and telling it in Arabic, getting a story in, e in Arabic, and telling it in English to children, women. Where do you think the explicitation occurred? When they retold the story in Arabic, or when they retold the story in English? Any guesses? If it's a universal of translation, we would hope to find more explicitation in the retelling in English. But in fact, she found explicitation everywhere. That explicitation may be a fact of retelling, no matter what the change of language. That the psychology might come from the simple retelling, or re-narration of a discourse. And I think if you look at the papers that you're going to look at now, you think, wait a minute, what is translating? Well, there are two things. It's retelling the text, and it's changing language. And if we find that something happens, it might be due to the change of language. They've all been linguists, so they think that's the cause. But it might also be due simply to the fact of retelling. And if we had a few good psychologists among us, they might see that as a potential cause as well. <coughs> 